Welcome everyone to Talking Drupal. Here we are at episode 72 on November 6th, 2014. And today we're going to talk about mobile friendly Drupal. Are you guys mobile friendly? Yes. Yes, I am. Right, okay. We all have phones, right? So I'm mobile friendly, but I'm not very responsive. <laughs> You're not very responsive. I've been saying that for years, John. Ah, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, welcome everyone. Episode seventy-two. Uh, just a quick note: um, we, the last time we spoke, we were at seventy. So we skipped an episode here. We had episode seventy-one that we uh, cheated. I guess I can't, we cheated a little bit. Maybe I'm not sure if it's called <laughs> cheating. <laughs> But uh, we had our, our New England Drupal camp on Saturday, November 1st, and I recorded Jeff Robbins' keynote speech, which was what I've learned from rock and roll. I'm not sure I have that title exactly right. But, uh, but Jeff, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. It really was. And the surveys that we've, uh, we've we asked for surveys for people who attended and the response to Jeff's talk has really been spectacular. And for people who don't know, Jeff is the CEO of Lullabot. And I'm sure you've heard of who Lullabot is as a Drupal agency. And what people often don't know is that Jeff was also the front man for a rock band in the 90s called Orbit. And his speech, his talk on Saturday was about the lessons that he learned from being in the music business and how they apply to his Drupal business, so it was it was really entertaining, our uh, inspiring too. Um, yeah, well, as he really he talked about, and I, I think what was so great about it is that he really was able to connect it to how we all go about our work, whether we're in an agency, whether we work on our own, um, if you're in a larger organization. I mean, it really was. I was really fantastic the way he kind of connected it just down to a very personal level about how you conduct yourself, how the open source community works and thrives, and um, how, how you can be a, a better a better part of it. It was really about goal. It was really about personal goal setting to me. Is is setting what you know? What are the important things in terms of achieving your goals in business and in life, and the things that stuck out uh, stuck out to him and and how he's achieved some of those things. So it, it was it was great. It was a great speech. And what we ended up doing was uh, recording it. And episode 71, uh, you can go back and listen to. There's a short intro from me, and then it's Jeff for 55 minutes, I think. So please go out and enjoy. Um, and for episode 72 here today, we have Jason Pomental from h and Design. As Hello. usual. <laughs> As usual. <laughs> Trying to, trying to get back to it being usual. Almost missed it again yesterday. Thankfully, you couldn't do it either, so we ended up having to change the day, but had a, another last-minute detour to one more conference yesterday down at Future Web Design in New York. And how did that go? Well? Um, it was great. I got to moderate a panel on the, the, the Web Designer's Toolkit of the Future. We had um, Paul wow. Tani, who is the... Uh, cloud evangelist for Adobe um, for their platforms. We're talking about brackets, and we had um, uh, Tom uh, Genitazio from Macaw, who's an awesome front-end development tool, and um, Ben Jordan from uh, uh, Envision App, which is another like awesome mm -hmm. prototyping platform, and Val Head, the uh, incredible designer and um, writer and speaker about um, web animation. So it was really it was a great conversation about what designers need to know and um, what they should know and where all those kinds of tools fit in the process. So it was it was good. We really had a nice time. After all that name dropping and the two minutes of you telling about it, give us the two points you took away from that. <laughs> two um, points we can share. Uh, everybody agreed that designers need to know something about code and the system in which what they're doing has to live, and we need tools that allow us to think more fluidly during that design process, but don't hamper moving on to the real deployment and development of that. Um, whether you're doing it or whether you're working with somebody else, all of these tools are really geared around. And Brackets, actually, is one that's really applicable to us. It's a great 
um, great code editor that really is very different from one of the ones that I've seen. A lot of really con great contextual help and, and stuff like that. Jason, if you could stick in the show notes here the links to yeah. the products you just mentioned. Sure. And uh, so anyone listening could check them out later. And uh, we also have John Picozzi from Oomph, who was the sponsor of the New England Drupal Camp this past weekend. Thanks for coming, Johnson. Jo Johnson. How is <laughs> <laughs> John and Jason mixed together? <laughs> So I just want to call him Johnson now, but I just feel like that'll end up being really inappropriate. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Uh, John is laughing too hard that he can't even get to the microphone. So maybe we should move on to Nick. Nick Laughlin from Enlightened Design. How you doing? <laughs> uh, I'm actually going to have to listen back to that talk. You know, I was, I was there. It was a great talk. Uh, definitely got a lot out of it. The camp overall was a huge success. I'm sure we'll have a show coming up in the next couple of weeks, uh, two, three weeks, where we kind of do a recap. Um, but today we're talking about mobile and responsive, and uh, definitely a hot topic. It's been around for a little while, but people are still catching on. It's funny that you said we, we're talking about mobile and responsive. And, you know, our title is actually a mobile-friendly Drupal website. So it, it's interesting to know where responsive fits in and where it doesn't. And, you know, responsive is the term that everyone thinks of immediately when you think of a mobile friendly. But I think some of the points we're going to get to today is it's not only about responsive design. There's right. lots of other things you can be doing for a website to make it mobile friendly. So, John, I think John is done laughing, and I apologize for that poor introduction, John. Not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> We've gone this far without a Freudian slip, so, you know, it had to happen eventually. I don't know what you mean. Just going to let that one go. Yep. I, I, think, I think John is just exhausted here. So, John, uh, um, Oomph sponsored, let's, let's go back to the introductions. Oomph sponsored the, uh, your company sponsored the, the uh, Drupal camp we just did, and um, have any comments about that? and then we can go on to today's show. Uh, my comments about it are um, that uh, I feel like it went really well, and uh, everybody had a good time, um, both on the attendee side and on the sponsor side. So that's uh, that's all we were looking for. So okay. we, were, we were glad to do it, and uh, on with the show. So let's move on. Okay, so... What do we mean, today's show, we call it mobile-friendly Drupal? Fascinating so, to me. So, so my, what does everyone mean by that? Yeah, the, the thought I had behind this was, um, <clears throat> you know, we talk a lot about responsive. And uh, when I go um, out to speaking engagements or, or talk to, to business owners, not, not so much web people, but business owners, um, a lot of times they talk about the mobile website, the M dot website, um, and how they can get a mobile website. And you know, my first response to them is always, "Well, you really want a responsive website, um, but some instances a require that mobile website, or b require different content for that mobile website." Um, a great example of this is uh, in Drupal, a lot of times you'll have um, a certain navigation um, and you need to swap out that navigation when you get down to the mobile version of your website. Or you'll have um, sidebar blocks on your desktop website that aren't really necessary for the, um, for the, for the mobile version. And I think what we're going to talk about a little bit today is some of the methods you can use to kind of manipulate your content for your, your mobile website. And this could be a, a true mobile website or, a, more ideally, a responsive website that you just need to manipulate that content for a little bit. So, John, what do you mean by a true mobile website? Uh, so, you know, a lot of times a mobile website or an MDOT website is a a duplication or, or a different version of your website. And 
granted, we should be moving away from this, but um, these still still exist in the wild. Um, I, I, I don't really condone them um, unless there's a really, really good reason. Uh, I'm a very much a fan of, of a responsive website, but the point is there are still websites out there that are mobile versions and are, are completely different from your desktop version of your website. I, th I think we probably could pretty quickly get into violent arguments about whether or not any of these things are, are worth doing, but, but I think that's kind of not the point. I mean, I think there's, there's things about using a website on a mobile device that are specific to using it on a mobile device, things like making sure a date can be tapped on and turned into an event, or a phone number can be tapped on and, and used to make a phone call. And browsers are usually pretty good at handling that stuff, but not always. And, and if we mark things up better, um, then, then that, that works better. But then, you know, there's issues of performance and scaling assets and, um, you know, how to, how to make things just behave well when you're serving it to a big screen or a small one. And I think that's really the point of the title is the word friendly is to... What can we do in our web development to make our websites more mobile friendly? Um, does it mean they need to be mobile perfect or mobile excellent or mobile apps, but just friendlier uh, in a better experience for those mobile users that are out there? And that's sort of the focus. The focus today is to talk about what some of those things are. It might be from the user experience, and then from a developer side is what are the tools that we have access to in the Drupal environment to make those things happen easier. So, <clears throat> how about if we jump into what are the, some of the things that are important to us when we're looking at our websites on a mobile phone, things that we'd love to see happen to make that a more friendly experience. Jason, I don't, actually, I don't want to turn this into a responsive design show. Jason actually just hit on one of them. It's like my biggest pet peeve when I'm on a website um, is the <clears throat> phone numbers actually not being clickable and opening up, you know, and, and actually calling that number. Um, you know, there, every so often I'll come across a website and I'll be like, oh, I really need the phone number for this website. I'll get to the phone number and I'll, I'll hit the button and nothing happens. And I'm just like, oh, why doesn't this work? It's so annoying. And then I end up trying to copy and paste it and just get more frustrated. So that's one of my biggest pet peeves right there is, is phone numbers actually working and activating the call feature yeah. on your phone. Well, and that's, you know, I think that's actually what, like some of the, the core things that I think we're, we're talking about today are, are things that are not, like they aren't things that are shared with the desktop. Right. I mean, it's not, whether it's responsive or not, when you're looking at it on your phone, you are looking at it on a phone, and a phone can be used to make phone calls. And so anything that's being presented there should make that easier. And marking up content in a way that makes that harder or that it's, it's sort of locked up in um, other kinds of displays and graphics and um, in text that's not been sort of marked up in a way to make this possible... Um, which is weird to me because sometimes you, you can do it. You can completely break that automated functionality that most phone browsers have. Um, but, you know, we can use HTML5 tags to indicate that things are indeed, you know, or, or microformats is another way to do it, um, to indicate that things are clickable and that it's a phone. So it's possible today, like, if you don't do anything, if you've formatted the text to look like a phone number the browser will interpret that and try to make it a phone number. But there's stuff we can do to, to help the browser know that better. Right. What are the best ways to do that in Drupal? Field formatting. You know, when, when you bring it out, making sure that you're specifying that field as a telephone number, and Drupal actually will take care of a lot of that. Mm -hmm. and, that's so, and that can come in the form of on the editing side, making sure that it presents the right way for somebody to enter it, but also the way it gets marked up in HTML on output um, is different, indicating that something's an email address or that it's a date. Um, if you look at the way dates come out, 
that's really smart. And actually, the, the date module does a great job of that in Drupal 7, of like indicating it and like marking it up correctly with micro formats and stuff like that. So if you tap on that date, that can create an event on the right date, on the right time, in the right time zone. Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. And that's the kind of stuff that's super useful on a phone. So, so it's important before we before we move to dates is that the the num the phone number has been challenging for us in the past, in that it I think the I think the so we're looking at basically putting a is it a T E L L right tell colon uh, in, just one L actually I think is it one L okay yeah. tell colon in the um, the anchor tag, but that can't have any. Spaces or dashes or anything in it. It needs to be the digits of the phone number, I believe. So it 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 creates a, a few challenges unless you're using some modules that will do that for you. Well, and that's that's why I mentioned the the field formatters. And I think you know it's um, a really a, a good example that's come up for us recently uh, was actually um, something that. We, we did almost unintentionally, but actually ended up working out really well, um, using, you know, creating a, a field in a content type for a phone number using the telephone field. You know, it's a module, you add it in, and it sort of defines it as a telephone number. So when that comes out, it's marked up with, um, with some HTML that indicates that it's, it's a phone number. And then you can add other things to that if you want to have inline validation for formats and stuff like that. But by and large, just by adding that, um, we just, uh, it's sort of been a, a soft launch, but we've been working on a big project for um, for Yale University, and one of the things is department pages um, for their grad school. And, and it's, um, and it works beautifully. You look at it on the phone, and you can tap right on any one of those phone numbers, and it just brings up the call, call button, you know, do you want to call them? And, and we didn't have to do anything else. Um, for so, country codes or anything. So, John, John, you mentioned that the telephone number was a pet peeve for you. How do you guys handle it? Do you have any special techniques? There, there isn't. There is another way to do this, right? It's called call to colon that you can use, and it's it's not clear to me exactly what the difference is between those. I don't know if any of you guys have any insight into that. I think Skype uses call to colon, and some browsers support it, and some don't. But, John, I'm wondering if you have any additional insight. Uh, I really don't. Um, all the method methods that uh, Jason talked about are are um, have worked uh, for us in the past. Um, I know one website in particular I was having a problem with um, <clears throat> was a scenario where the phone number wasn't really a link on the desktop, but it needed to obviously be a link on the on the um, the mobile experience and. Uh, I think we we utilized the the tell um, uh, we wrapped that that maybe in a span or something and put the put the tell in there with the with the phone number and that kind of resolved it. Um, I may be misremembering that it was a while ago, but um, you know field formatters are really the way to go. I mean, once you kind of tell Drupal it's a phone number, Drupal uh, you know pretty much does what it needs to do for it. Is there any reason why we wouldn't? Put this tag on the desktop as well as the mobile layout. Um, I don't think there's any reason not to. I mean, you're I just you're wrapping it with an href, right? And and it actually the the syntax is kind of interesting. So I mean, you mentioned you, you need to make sure that um, you have a complete phone number that doesn't confuse things. Um, right. But it, you know, if you if you mark it up, you know, a href tell colon uh, if it's in the U.S., it's plus one would be the country code. If you're originating in the U.S., it's plus zero one one if you're outside. But I mean, we, that's figure you can figure that out. Area code, phone number, and you can even do extensions by adding a P, which translates to a pause and the extension number. And can that I, that's the, the the contents of the link tag. Can I ask what the what the point though is on a desktop? I mean, there's um, no there's no phone functionality on a desktop. Yeah, but if the the browser made yeah, it harder, know that Skype. Mine doesn't. kicks off Skype, and mine kicks off Skype for most phone numbers. Yeah, I, think, yeah, I, think you I would imagine it would be also for Google. Yeah. Well, and that's actually you know, as well. Mac OS is trying to make this work. It, it actually has just been kind of an annoyance for me so far. But with Yosemite, 
and I, if I have my phone on the same Wi-Fi network, my phone starts to ring, and all of a sudden it starts to ring on on my laptop. Yeah, I haven't been able to answer a phone with that yet, but you know that's I did, coming. I did that yesterday for the first time, actually, not to derail the conversation, but um, I found it really, really useful, really, really um, well, helpful. Um, and not to have to like pick my phone up, I can just answer it right from my computer. So I mean, I, I think that's that's the reason right there is it is increasingly, you know, it's the right markup, it's the appropriate markup, it's the semantically correct markup for a phone number that will then, in most cases, tie into whatever is the phone calling mechanism that is available on that system. Right. Okay. I can, I can get by on that. Yeah. And that's, so, I mean, there's this weird little gray area between, like, using microdata formats and what is sort of appropriate HTML5. And I think the href with the tel colon is the appropriate HTML5 way of doing it that I think is most universal. So we have a question coming in uh, from someone listening online. It says, is the plus one required? And it's only required if you're outside of the U.S. If you're making a, if it's a U.S. number and you're sitting in the U.S. on the website, it's not required. Yeah, I mean, what I think increasingly, especially because Google is used, Google, well, Google's used everywhere too, but, but Drupal is really an international right. platform. And... And that's, I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. You know, there's, we, we all live in the U.S., but there's a ton of people that use Drupal that don't. And, and I think it's, it's good for us to keep in mind whatever we do should be the way it should be handled any place it's going to be used. So you, you say most of the people, is it the majority of people um, outside the U.S.? Oh, I, you, you know, I, be, I, right? I, say, I, don't, I don't really mean to say most, but I would, yeah, yeah. I would say it could be half, could be more than that. Right. I don't. Know. I mean, there's you know, there's a couple thousand people that show up at DrupalCon in Europe, and I mean, it's it is bigger in the U.S., but it's not that much bigger. And then you know, there's all kinds of. Uh, I mean, isn't isn't the point there really though? Your I mean, your website's global. It's not just in the U.S. Exactly. So somebody's in Canada. Somebody's in Mexico. They're looking at your yeah. website. Yeah. They, you know, and they they click on the number. It's not going to work for them. Yeah. So let's move on to some of the other things that we think are. Things we could do to make the your website more mobile friendly. So another one on the list here is any addresses linking to a map. Clearly, that's helpful on the desktop too, but extremely helpful on a mobile phone. Certainly, if you're a local business trying to get someone to come to your location, well, so more, any address should be linked to a map. More more than just a map, just linking it to um, navigation. I find most of the times when I'm on a mobile device and I'm looking at an address and I click on it, I don't care about the map. I'm looking to figure out how to get there from where I am. Well, I think when Steve says map, I think he means the map app. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean Google yeah. Maps. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, I, don't, I think he means the Apple app because map, Apple app, map, app, well, app, it doesn't Apple mean map, app. No, you, it, but but you link, get there. Uh, tied to a, a lat lawn coordinate that can be passed to any mapping application on whatever that that device is. Yeah, I've actually found that um, you know, I think I think being being general in that instance is a good thing. I, I found that once Apple came away from using Google Maps, any link any any address that goes to a Google Map is now ridiculously hard to um, to to get to and to use um, on an Apple device, which is unfortunate. Yeah. But. So, so uh, when we're talking about a link, we're just talking about it's really just an anchor tag to a website. Are you saying that? And I'm I'm not a regular Apple phone user currently. So you're saying if I stick a a link to a Google Map, it's hard to use on a. Yeah. So what the the, the standard the really? standard action there uh, that I found at least, and maybe I'm you know maybe I'm not using it correctly. Um, but you click on the link, and the link goes to Google and tries to open Google Maps, and then you get um, Google trying to say, "Hey, download the Google Maps app," and then it's just really hard to use on your phone. Um, at least I find Google Maps very hard to use on my phone. Um, so that's where it can that's, get that's frustrating. That's an issue with Google. You're saying that Google is stepping in between, saying, "Hey, you're coming from an iPhone. We prefer you to download our app." 
Right, right, right. yep. But ultimately, the, the, the Google Maps application on the phone is, is hard to use as well. So at least I find it hard to use. Well, I th the important thing is what you want to do is mark it up as an address. You don't right. have to link to a map. I mean, you can, and that's helpful on the desktop, but on a phone, you want it marked up as an address so that the phone will take care of it. The phone browser takes over there, and it links to whatever mapping application is present on that system, just the way it does automatically with phone numbers. Okay, so could you just give uh, an example of what that, that markup might look like, kind of high, high level? Um, the, the best thing that you can do is act, and we can put a link to the show notes on this. Um, there's a couple of different places that I've found good information about it, but using microdata formats there, either you can find out about it on HTML5 Doctor or dive into HTML5, um, and I'll, I'll put some links to the show notes in there um, so you can figure out how to do that. So again, it's just like the way you mark up a phone number. You just customize the wrapping HTML around it so that it's indicated that this is an address, and, and the phone browser will take over from there. And does anybody know if the location module actually does that on output when you output an address from location? I believe it does. So so do I. I just wanted a confirmation. Yeah. Um, I, I believe Geofield also does that. Um, it, and you can change whether it's well-known text or Latin longitude when I mean, you have a lot of configuration options. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you want to get more explicit and you know, format the link so that it takes you into a mapping application with the business name and, and all that other stuff. You can do that, but, you know, I think what we want, what we're, we've been talking about is, like, what are the things you can trust markup and browsers to handle so that you're doing the least amount of additional stuff and relying on the system and the, and the structure and the, the code to, to do the work for you in its most native way. All right, so next next item, someone pick something off they want to chat about. Next, um, uh, I, next I think, friendly feature. I think text. I mean, you know, shocker that I'd bring that yeah. one up. But um, you know, all the all the devices have all the device makers have put a huge amount of effort into figuring out what is a readable size of default text, that hundred percent size. And I think the biggest mistake people make is trying to enforce a specific size in that case. So on the desktop, a lot of us got used to font size 100% being equivalent to 16 pixels, but then we've taken that further, perhaps in some cases, saying, okay, well, I'm just going to set it to 16 pixels. And, and that's, that's just a bad idea, because increasingly what a pixel is doesn't really matter. Um, and we can't really say exactly what that is because the, the resolution of screens keeps increasing. But more importantly, um, the dense pixel density on small phones, 16 pixels is kind of irrelevant. But 100% always works. And so that's actually something that I think is pretty important for us to make sure that we're basing all of our typographic systems and our themes around this so that the browser presents the most appropriate size and then the user has the ability to use the phone's OS to control the overall size of everything. If they need bigger text, they should be able to go into the accessibility settings for that device and say, I want bigger text, and have your website move with it. And, and so that's why you, know, you want to tie into whatever the default is as much as possible. And I, and I think paired with that, um, Steve, I think you would put in something about um, finger sizes, because we want to remember that we're interacting with this thing with a really blunt pointer. You know, I mean that's mm. that's that's a, a big fat thing that gets jammed down on the screen, whether it's and a link. One. So like padding around text links, um, size of hit areas of buttons, like those things are all. We have a very imprecise pointer that we're dealing with, so you want to make sure that you size things actually just a little bit bigger than you might think is really necessary. Give stuff some breathing room. Um, but you know, again, like that's entirely in your theme. That's not something that is going to be pushed on um, by anything else. It's really up to you to decide what you want for text size. It's just important to remember that in your um, in your theme to make sure that it's as useful as possible. Well, if, if you're going to spend some time thinking about how to make stuff mobile friendly, being able to read the content easily should really probably be at the top of our list, not midway through. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I, I I tend to put it there, but right. you know, that's that's my thing. So I, right. that's what I go with. I, I think being able to read the content is probably should be everyone's thing. By the way, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay, what else? What else, what else the hot spots for you, John and Nick? Uh, one that I wanted to um, mention uh, is actually in the list, but doesn't just apply to images. It uh, says not simply hiding images from layout after they have been down downloaded. Um, so a lot of times um, you need to hide things in your in your mobile version of your website uh, and a, a lot of times just using display none is not the best way of going about that um, you know I, I have found in the past that again from the top of the show I was talking about um, you know switching out navigation or removing sidebars a lot of this stuff could be done with CSS and just using display none um, but that's really not the best approach because that stuff's already loading to your to your mobile device and then you're hiding it. So the user is is you know paying paying that price for downloading that content. Now a lot of people will say that oh well if if you don't need it on the mobile device do you really need it on the desktop? Well you saved me from saying it. Again I I, I agree with that but there are scenarios where you just need different content or you need to reconfigure something to work with the mobile device um, better or differently than it does on the desktop. Um, and for that, uh, I've relied on uh, the context module and a couple of add-on modules for that um, context breakpoint. And so, John, on... before you move on, sure. I want to I want to just frame this discussion a little bit stronger here because I really think it's an important one in. I know at least the three of us have debated this in the past. Uh, probably not on a podcast, but certainly face to face. Is your point being that there's times that you have content that you're displaying on the desktop that you do not want to show up on the mobile device? Yep. I know Jason has a and he kind of commented a little bit saying, "Hey, if it's not important on the on the mobile device, then is it important on the desktop?" Let's just let's just talk about that for a couple of minutes before we talk about the technical technical implementations of doing what you're talking about. Yeah, I'd like to preface that by saying I'm I'm very much in Jason's camp of okay. hey, if it's not needed on the desktop, do we really need it? On, or vice versa, if it's not needed on the mobile device, do we really need it on the desktop? And you know, I would say this isn't a common occurrence. Um, or a common practice uh, for me or for us, I should say, um, to you know start hiding stuff on the mobile device. We're very much like we're very much of the camp, you know, manipulate the content down to make it usable for for mobile um, from desktop versions. Um, but there are some instances, and in the past I've had instances where um, content just needs to change. Whether it's a, a view you need to change the uh, interface with or, or a slideshow that just needs to be taken out. Um, there have been instances in the past where this, it, it has been needed to, to change, change the content or remove a block or view. Yeah, I, you know, I, we've well, we we can just agree to disagree on that. We I think we always have, but I think, um, Jason, you can't you 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 can't disagree with me that there are some scenarios at which <laughs> some content just doesn't need to be displayed on a mobile device or needs to be displayed differently on a mobile. Device. Displaying it differently is one thing. You accomplish that with CSS. I mean, you we've talked about it before, and you've presented a case in a number of times where you felt that that was the right answer, and I simply didn't agree with you. That's okay. We don't have to agree. I, I, I don't I don't I I agree with the fact that we don't need to agree on it, but I also think <laughs> I, I also think that you can't you can't be blind to the fact that if you at some at some point you're going to have you may have to do this. So what what about the situation where you have a lot of information in the header, like a phone number, an email address, a logo, and a couple other things? That's also displayed in the footer on the desktop, 
but then on mobile you decide that the header is not as important as the content, but you're keeping the footer. Would you consider that a valid case to re just remove the header on mobile? Or I mean, you still have the information, but you're actually you are removing a section. Well, I I might think about how to handle it differently on the small screen. I mean, I think one of the thing one of the decisions that we made with this latest project was like some of the utility links and stuff like that that we often have in the header. We've actually pushed all of that along with the main navigation into an off canvas layer, so that when you expose that, you actually you get the search, you get the the, the topical navigation pages, you get the main navigation, all that stuff comes in, and that gave us a much more compact header that had a menu button and a home button. Those are the things that were that were visible there, and and then you got right into the site content. So I mean, you know, I think. A lot of the questions that that you raised, John, are, are to me they're they're design questions that need to be solved. But I've and and you know I do my best to keep an open mind with every project, and I have listened every time you have brought this up. And you know we've talked about this on. I mean we've been doing responsive design for three four years, something like that. And and so you know we've talked about this a lot. And I just, I am of the mindset that I think that the content is there for a reason. It needs to be there. You may need to present it differently, and that's what media queries are for. And if you structure your code that way from a mobile-first perspective, that you can get there. So something you just you just said right there, um, and it, it was more in reference to functionality or display of the content, right? You know, the hypothetical I always go back to for this is, say, for example, you were displaying a set of content in um, an accordion menu on your on your desktop version, right? And the maybe the accordion, you know, I know that accordions work pretty well on, on mobile devices, but maybe the accordion was taking up too much space on your mobile device, and you wanted to switch that to a flex slider, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. You know, the methodology for doing that would be to to use one of these one of these modules that we're going to talk about in a minute to switch out that content. I mean, is that uh, is that something in, well, in your opinion that that's that's not acceptable or that should be done with CSS? Um, I think it's not necessary because if you code the page yourself, then you're going to use JavaScript to switch out the classes tied to your media queries. And you have the same set of nested ULs that can be flex uh, a flex slider or an accordion. So I, that that would be my answer. Is like that's a that's a front end issue tied to dealing with that design requirement. How about advertising? Advertising's hard, but if you are, I mean, I dealt with this on Martha Stewart's website when I was doing the work for Lullabot. I mean, we had to work it out. And so they, what what they had design, developed was um, a, a JavaScript contain a container that on page load would check the media query and fire off the request for the right ad. And so that's how they handled getting the appropriate ad request going so to fill the size container that you had in that layout. That's so essentially. I think that touches a little bit on what John was getting to a little. Yeah, bit. that's essentially what the context breakpoint module is doing. Um, it's essentially taking uh, using JavaScript to look at what your screen resolution is, and then adjusting the content based on on that um, screen resolution. So, context breakpoint, working in conjunction obviously with the context module, is giving you the ability to say, "Oh, okay, swap out or on this context, do this thing," whether it's load a flex slider or load a um, uh, accordion menu or simply just you know change the page theme or you know whatever that context is it's basically giving you hooks into your breakpoints for context to react to well but I think that the difference is the one instance where I've really had to deal with that loading something at runtime was because you had to place a fixed asset into a flexible area. And that's an ad. So ads have cost implications and fixed sizes that are going in there because none of the networks are doing responsive advertising yet. 
So it was, is it a, a, a tall, thin banner, uh, a wide, thin banner, or a 250 by 300 asset? And so it was the only way that, that you could effectively deal with that. Mm. I think for what you're suggesting with those two things, you're dealing with something on the server to serve one of two different things, which in my mind is adding complexity to the site. You're adding more modules and adding more things in context where that seems to be a, a pretty easy markup solution to me. But, uh, you know, I don't use the flex slider module. I, I, do, I do it myself. I, I get I use semantic views to output a nice clean little set of unordered uh, unordered lists with the assets that I want, and and I, this is just how I've always done it because I've been working with it longer than there was a module. That's all. So let's talk about images a little bit. Jo John, are you are you? Did you finish your point? I just to make sure. Um, I was going to mention the context mo mobile detect module, yeah, but yeah, um, yeah, right. Uh, essentially, the context mobile detect module um, works with a PHP library on your server to um, do server-side detection of a um, uh, user's device. So what it does is it'll, it'll give you um, context hooks into whether it's a tablet, a mobile device, or a desktop device and allow you to uh, serve up different stuff based on, when, when I say stuff, I mean blocks, views, anything that you can display via context um, with those hooks. So for example, if I went to a site on my mobile device and you know uh, I needed to serve up the mobile navigation, now granted you can do all that with CSS, which I, I advocate for, you know, definitely do it with CSS. Um, but for some reason, if you needed to swap out menus based on, based on it being a mobile device, this module would allow you to do that um, at the server level, so you wouldn't have uh, another request going back and forth. Um, is, is that is that detecting based on device or detecting based on resolution? Do you do you know how that works? I think it's based on device because what the what the library is looking at is it's uh, doing a, it's using the user uh, user agent string mm -hmm. that's be, that's in the request. Um, and you can actually select it. I think the last time I used it, it had devices that you could select in there. So you could say, oh, is it an Android device? Is it a Windows device? Is it a um, iOS device? Um, so you can you can nail it down to um, those specific uh, you know those specific devices. Do they could also be useful. I'm um, sorry, Nick. It could also be useful for saying um, displaying a message to those specific devices. For example, if you wanted a banner ad for, um, you know, the, the iOS app to take them to the App Store, you could, you could use it in that methodology as well for, you know, promoting, um, uh, you know, device-specific content. You were going to say something, Nick? Yeah, so I'm curious if that module gives you an idea of how accurate it is, because I know lots of people have, you know, do user agent switching or just have the phones that don't provide them, that kind of stuff. Do you, do you have an idea of the coverage of that app, I mean, or module, rather? So it's, you know, I've used it once or twice, so I, and it's it's been a while, but uh, the, the one or two times that I have used it, it has worked really well at detecting um, mobile, tablet, um, desktop, and as well as, uh, you know, what type of device or what OS the device was running. So... Um, works works fairly well. Okay. Let's move on to images. So, <clears throat> the very first bullet that we have on the list here is performance, yeah. or speed, and a lot of that is dictated by not only some of the things that we've been talking about in the last ten minutes, which is the the amount of markdown coming to the mobile markup device. Or markdown. What's that? Or is your markdown written in markup? Or is your markup in your markdown? Yeah, mark markup. Sorry, I said markdown, didn't I? So, um, is images. So, what are the tactics to for Drupal people to deal with images? So, we're we're delivering smaller images to smaller devices. Well, one of That's them the actually question. follows on what John was just talking about, um, and I mean, I think user agent sniffing is always tricky. So using that as a way to determine what to serve, I, I think, is sort of fraught with peril. But there is, um, 
there is a really great combination method adopted by adaptive images, which is the first thing that I think we all looked at when it, and I think we, we talked about it in, a, in the workshops that we taught um, as a way to use a combination of um, user agent and JavaScript on the client side setting a cookie to look at what is this window size and, and then using that to make a determination about image size. So rather than saying look at this user agent string which at times could have said iPhone but meant iPad or maybe it's no user agent at all. So I mean like that stuff can be hard but then if you have JavaScript layered in there as well which is how adaptive images works then you end up looking at the window size in JavaScript and then being able to set something a little more intelligently that way and and then it's it's tied into uh, the adaptive image module brings that into your image preset styles and it works really nicely to basically work with Drupal to look at the size of the device and pick the next largest preset to serve an image that's closer to the correct dimensions for that device but still will will render well you know, oversizing a little bit rather than undersizing it. So the user is downloading a smaller image. Yep, and it, and it is based on the initial load, so you right. can't like just move your browser around and expect it to load. It's really, it's really it's for the device better. kind of thing, yeah. really. Right, right. So it's like per session, it sets it based on where the window was. Right. So if you had a small window open on your desktop and then you made it bigger, you'll get crappy images. But that's fine. I mean, people don't actually do that. They They go to the browser and, and they'll get um, whatever they you know is n natural for that device and it that's a pretty drag and drop like plug-in replacement um, the picture module though that you actually I, th I think just just to correct you and I think we've had this discussion in the past <laughs> get deja vu I, I think it's looking at your window size and I don't think the size of your browser being small or big makes a difference um, it, it does on the initial load because it's it's querying um, it's querying the viewport in the JavaScript. That's all JavaScript can know. It can't know your monitor resolution. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to debate this again. No, I think it's getting a, a parameter back as what the window resolution capability is, and not what you're actually the size is that you have it at. But I, th I think we discussed this before and debated it. But I you know, really I, 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 like I have all the stuff on my system. I really yeah. should just I should just yeah. test it. Because it's in the workshop code. And you'll find out that I'm right, but that's okay. I thought that may very well be the case. <laughs> but I think the important thing is it yeah. works really reliably, and, it, and, and after that first initial page load, right. it's not relying upon anything other than the cookie that's been set. And if the cookie's not available, then it defaults back to JavaScript. Right. But it ties into Drupal image styles. So it works really nicely within that flow that you already have. And you can add this into any existing Drupal site and instantly get much better performance in what you're serving to a variety of devices. Even if the rest of your site isn't responsive, it still makes makes things better. So what's different with the picture module? So that's adaptive images module we've been yep. discussing, really. What's different in the picture module, which is relatively uh, new? Um, the picture module is actually using the new picture element from the HTML spec that is working its way through the ratification process. So um, there's the picture element, and then there's image, and then there's source set within the image tag. So there's actually a couple different things that play there in terms of responsive images. But um, this is a way for you to supply more than one selected image that is then served to devices of different sizes. Now, I, I haven't used the picture module. How's the interface? Is it easy enough for content writers that are fairly knowledgeable to use it, or is it? Um, you know, I actually I don't know because I've only ever used it in like straight HTML in a workshop. I haven't used it as a Drupal module yet. Okay. Um, but I, I noticed that it was pulling in picture fill so that you can get it to work in older browsers and stuff. I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting things here. So I'm definitely gonna download. It. And they actually have um, I think that they have a Drupal 8 demo. Well, it looks like it's offline, but um, 
So, I mean, I think in terms of ways to incorporate that into a Drupal 8 site, too, would be, you know, really pretty interesting. Yeah, because I think it, it has the potential to very quickly become, especially if you have more than one image on a page, having to upload three or five images for each. Right. Well, as well as... So the, the recommendation is actually to not use the picture element if all you want to do is supply the re appropriately resized asset to that device. So in that case, you're using the image tag with the source set attribute, and, and there's like media query syntax layered in there. And I don't, I don't know if the picture module, excuse me, does that. It would be interesting to, to check that out. Um, but that's that's sort of like the state of responsive images at the moment. It's faster for performance um, and much easier on the editor if you're not supplying different images. If you want to supply what they how they refer to like art directed images, so you have a different crop um, that serve to the smallest device, then that's where the picture element really comes into play. All right, so let's let's move on to some other items that we might have here where it makes a a mobile-friendly website for Drupal. I, I actually wanted to go go back to one thing that actually does involve images. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, people love love their slideshows, love slideshows on their desktop websites. And uh, Jason alluded to uh, using Flex Slider um, a little bit earlier. I, I don't know that we we gave it really uh, a bunch of time. I wanted to go back there and. Actually, no, just ask worth it. Ask Jason a couple of questions about how he implements Flex Slider. Sure. Um, so you said that you you build out HTML and then just drop the Flex Slider library in. Yeah. So I um I have the Flex Slider JavaScript bundled into my theme, so it's it's there. And then uh, if I want to make a Flex Slider slideshow, I'll use Semantic Views to kind of construct. The, the elements in an unordered list that's nice and tidy. And um, in the scripts file, um, you know, I, can, I can name it. You know, if I'm using one on the home page and one somewhere else or whatever, um, I can write a, a, a short JavaScript function um, that will call the flex slider on that named element and pass it the parameters that I want. So if you want different delays, if you want, um, if you want it to loop, you know, all the parameters that you would get... Um, are you know you can just write into that one short little JavaScript. So a uh, suggestion I have, <clears throat> I actually just found this out. Um, they've removed the flex slider views slideshow from the flex slider module. So now you can actually install the flex slider module, um, and it will do all of that stuff, add it into the scripts, and 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 keep it keep it um, you know uh, available to you, and you. Can can, you can make calls to it from modules and template files, cool. um, similar to how you're doing how you're doing it. Um, so that's actually we just implemented that on a site that we're going to be launching soon, and and that's how we went about it um, because we needed to basically take two views and put them together into one um, ordered list, and then put it out as a flex slider. Right. So um, we use the flex slider module in combination with uh, in combination with uh, views templates to make that all all work together. Cool. Yeah, you know, I think, like I said, I had started playing around with Flex Slider and using it before there was a module, and early on it just seemed like there was so much overhead in using the module that it just didn't seem worth it. But I think that's actually one of the most important decisions that you can make in making mobile Drupal mobile friendly is, you know, what are the things that are worth using a module for? versus things that you just know you want to have as a part of things all the time. Yeah, so, the, re the reason I love having it, um, having it to be a module um, really just is the fact that A, it gets updated with, with Drupal, um, yeah. you know, pretty regularly, and B, it's integrated far, far better um, into um, your, your theme layer and your module layer and, and, and whatnot. Um, but I thought that was interesting, and the one thing I think we may have failed to represent uh, to, to state is why we use Flex Slider. Um, for those for those for those people that don't know, um, Flex Slider is basically a responsive slideshow. So most slideshows, um, and 
I know views slideshow. Um, the view slideshow module um, basically drops an image on a page with a, with a slideshow effect, which is nice. But when you go um, when you go down to uh, you know smaller sizes, that doesn't really resize that great, and in some instances can break. Um, here enters here enters um, Flex Slider, which is is not Drupal specific. It's a jQuery library um, that actually will build out a responsive. Um, slideshow for you. And, you know, it was actually, when the guy first created it, um, it didn't work in Drupal 6 because it required a newer version of jQuery. And I just asked him one day, and, like, literally within a few hours, he had another version of it rolled that worked with jQuery 1.3. And that's when I've been using it ever since. Are you taking the credit, Jason, for this? Um, for it working in Drupal 6, kind of, yeah. Okay, all right. Just wondering. <laughs> he was awesome about it. I mean, <laughs> Drupal 7, we, we, can, we can use new versions of jQuery, which is awesome. Um, but, you know, it was when I was working at Schoolyard, and we needed a good solution there. And, and it worked great, and it's swipeable when you're on a phone with a touch-based mm-hmm. interface. And, I mean, it's just, it's, and it doesn't care what you put in that slide. You can layer things together. You can bring all kinds of content and assemble it into a layout, as long as it's inside that list item that's called a slide, then you're fine. You know, it'll work. Works with, works with videos, works with all sorts yeah. of content. Yeah, it's really really flexible, which is, is funny because it's called Flex Slider. I mean, there there are other ones that have come along that, that I think are worth looking at, but again, it's like one of those things that's just not broke, so like I've been using it for years now. Um, important to note that occasionally, depending on the version that you're using, if you turn on JS caching, it doesn't work. Um, so it's important to make sure that you have the correct version of the yeah. library. Yeah, it is. I I have found, generally speaking, that um, new ones are better <laughs> in most yeah. cases. Um, you know, there's one other thing before we move away from images that I just learned yesterday that was just incredibly valuable. Drupal has a way of always wanting to insert height and width into the HTML output for a rendered image. Right. And I stumbled upon something yesterday that I, just, I cannot believe I did not know this until now. It's a five-line function to put in your template PHP file that uses the hook preprocess image function and just unsets those height and width variables. So every, oh. like, five lines removes the height and width from every single image ever output by Drupal anywhere. Wow. Please post that in the notes here. Oh, hell yeah. It was yeah, unbelievably useful. Yeah. Because I always have to, like, try and override it in CSS, and when I was working on this responsive email thing, having that stuff in there was a killer. It was just it was breaking everything. And I had to find a way to output it without that. And um, I, so I stumbled upon this one little function, and it's just amazing. Life changer. So let's let's just quickly touch on any other modules that we think would help people create more mobile friendly websites. The one I wanted to mention quickly is Navbar. Has anyone used that Navbar uh, module? No. It basically no. puts it's it's the module that Drupal 8 uses. So it builds the Drupal 8 uh, admin uh, Navbar into the Drupal Web 7 website. So it's very mobile friendly. So as you shrink your browser down, you've got the hamburger and you've got all the stuff that you have in Drupal 8, but you have it in Drupal 7. Unfortunately, the rest of your admin interface might not be so mobile friendly, but your nav bar is. So it, it really works well. Cool. Not sure it solves a complete problem, but want to mention it. Yeah, but you know what? It's all these things together. I mean, right. so like fences, HTML5 tools, and semantic views, That's and block class. That's that's another one. Like, those are, like, the must-have go-to modules for good HTML5 markup with lots of control and, um, and the, you know, the ability to name stuff to write better CSS so that you write less of it. I mean, so all good things this. for performance. So you brought up the navbar module... Is anyone familiar with a way to easily put that kind of quality of navbar into the user side of a theme? Out of the box. 
I've always, we've always, um, or I have in the past, I should say, have uh, subbed in um, the hamburger a uh, hamburger menu. Um, Is that a just, module? No, no. Basically, the the way that Jason had referred to implementing Flex Slider, um, we would uh, implement. Um, failing to remember the name of the jQuery uh, menu library, but um, essentially you would just add it into your uh, your theme, um, into your info file um, as a, uh, a, a JavaScript that is needed, um, and uh, it basically would um, turn your navigation into a, a menu, uh, a hamburger menu um, style navigation um, for mobile devices. Um, but you know, to, yeah. to answer your question, no, I have never found a module to do the same thing. I built it into the Beep Edition theme. Right. So if you use nice menus, then it can automatically take that same navigation object and turn it into a nice off-canvas navigation. But I've not really even thought about actually taking that further and, and making it its own module, but you certainly could. And I, and I actually... I've. In the workshop stuff, I've actually developed the drop-down aspect of it too, just in HTML. So I mean, I imagine you could probably take it away from re like needing nice menu and actually go back to a fully rendered navigation object. And so in the, I'm sure you know, someone has already done this. We just don't know what it is, right? Yeah, I don't know. I I I, I, I can't don't know. imagine I, someone hasn't, right? Um, because we've already we've all hand coded it ourselves, pretty much, right? Yeah, is where we're at. Okay, so let, let's move on to the module of the week. It's a good one. There's only one person to talk about this. There is. Mr. Would, module Maintainer. That would be me. Uh, Co-maintainer. Co let's let's okay. not mix, mix titles here. Yeah, uh, myself and our front-end uh, developer, John Siazzi, have been working on um, the front-end developer module, which is... Um, Admittedly, a work in progress, but the core functionality of it is to actually help, in <laughs> perfect for today's topic, help um, mobile developers uh, with uh, certain key features. Um, one of the, the um, prize features of this module is that it actually gives you a bar at the top of your, um, your above your admin bar that gives you the um, resolution of the device that you're on and, and kind of gives you a little flag as to what type of device it would be. Um, this is really helpful with um, not so much on desktops where we have uh, developer tools, but when you go down to a tablet or a mobile device where um, no developer tools are available, knowing, hey, that this tablet is this, this size for activating this breakpoint um, or media query for me. Um, that can be really, really helpful. Uh, there are a couple of other features in there, um, like uh, empty link detection and empty alt tag detection um, that will uh, basically outline with a red outline any images that have no alt te uh, text associated with them or links that are empty or go to a pound sign. So there are some other features that we're working in there. Um, but really helpful on the, on the mobile development front with um, identifying uh, breakpoints and uh, resolutions for uh, mobile and tablet devices. Great. Is anyone using it? Anyone else using it here? Um, I just downloaded it's, it. It's I okay even if they know. <laughs> Yeah, we we won't we won't throw anything at you. We use it uh, we use it quite frequently, obviously internally on our uh, on our own projects. But uh, yeah, Drupal.org is still down, so <laughs> you can't. can't yeah, that's right. Drupal.org has been down for a while. So before we close here, and I know we're really at the the t the deadline here. Let's take five minutes. and I'm going to start the clock. Let's talk about. <laughs> Let's talk about Drupal Geddon. I hate that name, though. By the way, I hate that it's been called that. But um, we're gonna have a show coming up in the future that sort of recaps this in maybe more detail or a lot more detail. But let's just spend a couple of minutes and talk about has has the issue from October fifteenth affected you as the host here? And I'm just curious on what people's thoughts are on it. 
because I have lots of thoughts that, and then they're all over the place. Actually, you know, I I know there's a problem. Um, I can't actually see the problem, which is challenging for the problem. It's hard to communicate the problem because you don't see anything, uh, but you know it's there, and you you don't know what it means. So I'm wondering how you guys are dealing with that that aspect of this. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult because, as you had pointed out earlier in a call, sites were hacked, but most hackers have not actually done anything with the websites. So sometimes it's difficult to approach a client and um, let them know the severity of the problem. Um, but even further, if you, there's no, like, there's no accepted steps for cleaning the website beyond building a new server and restoring from a backup prior to the release of the bug, um, uh, the release of the fix, which is um, drastic. Uh, it, it's, yeah. it, you know, it, it's drastic. It's impossible in many cases, Nick. I mean, yeah. to, to, on October 15th, the warning came out, and then two weeks later, it the resolution was, oh, by the way, restore from two weeks ago, not just your database, but your server. I mean, that's yes. and I, I think in some, in many I, I think in some cases, a reasonable, I mean, if you have, you know, version control on the site, it's very easy to see whether they modified any files or added files to the, the document root. Um, I think a reasonable solution is to spin yeah, but, up but the server. Nick, we, don't, we don't know, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but Typically, our, our version control, let's assume it's Git, is looking at a certain set of directory structures. Do we know that this hack could not have put something else somewhere it that's not in the Git structure? It depends. Yeah, it depends on the server setup. And that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Like a, a reasonable solution for some sites may be spin up a new server, um, examine your version control to see if anything was added, and redeploy from there. Examine. Um, examine the database manually um, for you know malicious code, import, and then do the same for the file system, uh, the you know the images, etc. Which it's still not going to be perfect, um, but if they were putting items outside the doc root, it most likely will remove that. Um, but really, if you don't restore on a new server, it's it's nearly impossible to be sure that it's a clean site. I, you know, I think one of one of the things that, and this isn't to minimize the risk, but I think a lot of sites were compromised, and we, you know, we went, we all went through all these steps, and Nick was awesome in in providing advice and guidance and links. Um, can't thank you enough for that. But you know, we went through all this process and we cleaned stuff out, and and we cross our fingers and we hope, and it sucks. But I also think that there was a huge number of these exploits that were automated. So stuff happened, people set up bots, they went through, they scanned stuff. Uh, so lots of things were compromised, but not necessarily manually. So I, I think that's why you see so many sites that were compromised, but have we heard much about anything actually being done beyond that? I think the answer was it, it hadn't happened yet. And with luck, maybe we have done enough to clean this. And again, like, this is a crappy way to, to have to put it, but I mean, honestly, unless unless you just throw everything out, create a new server, and go rebuild from something completely different and don't restore anything at all from that compromised server, how would you know? How would you be sure? I mean, you say you know, examine a database manually. If you got like a gigabyte database, what are you going to do? I mean, it's you know we're all in a really shitty position with it. Yeah, there, there are actually there's actually a post I found had a certain set of like five commands that you could run to kind of do a uh, do do some um, database and file comparison um, that would basically give you give you an idea uh, to Jason's point. Like, how are you ever going to know 100 percent? You know, yeah. database is huge. Things could be anywhere, but this would give you an idea of if anything um, in specific to the menu routing table right. was changed. Um, yeah, and, and there were there were some things that there were some things that showed up. I mean, I I went through some of those those things as well. I don't, I'm not sure I've gone through as much as you have, but um, but yeah, yeah, we to, lot, to be, cleaned a lot. We to went, be clear we went, that 
Oops, sorry, the, the Drush command is Drupalgeddon. Um, you can download it similar to a module. You have to clear Drush's cache, and then you can run the Drupalgeddon-test. It's pretty quick. Um, the thing, the really important caveat is that there are known exploits that it won't catch anything outside the Drupal root or Drupal website, number one. Number two, there are known exploits that it won't find. For example, I had a website that um, had a user called System that was created that was assigned the administrator role, and it did not find that. Um, but typically, it will find file put content entries in the menu router table. It will find non-standard um, files that were created, um, even if they're ones that you created. And it will um, it will tell you if there's a mega user role or random users created that don't have uh, create dates. Yeah, so yeah, that, that module helpful. that module is actually very helpful. Um, the the blog post I'm talking about was actually. Uh, in addition to that, there were um, some some commands you could run at the server level. Um, I will say that module actually did find on uh, one of our sites uh, two user accounts that had been created as well as a role, um, and uh, it was interesting because the role the role name was actually like mega user mega right. user yeah and and it didn't actually have full admin rights. It just basically had permission to um, obfuscate the um, access controls and the ability. It, it gave itself the ability to create users. So, it, yeah. it, you know, if you didn't if you didn't know any better and you looked at it, you might say, "Oh, this isn't this user. This role can't really do much of anything." We, yeah. we, I found, I found marks of it on all three different servers that we work with. I had to go through every single site, um, manually looked at every single admin user account. Um, I mean, th there were tells. It would, it would, you know, have a creation date of like 44 years ago. Right. I mean, there was yeah. a bunch of things that that would sort of you start to recognize the signs. So, I mean, you know, we I think we went through and and cleared cleaned out a lot of stuff, um, and we've just continued to modify. Um, I'm wondering how you guys feel about. This is a really serious exploit in terms of what someone would have the capability of doing. We don't know what they've done yet. Right. But how, does it make you feel differently about how closely Drupal has been looked at in terms of security? It looks like this issue's been here for years and only recently found. Does no. anyone feel any differently? I, I really don't, because I mean, you look at uh, you know a couple of the other things that have come out this year, and you know the the most notable is is Heartbleed, right? Um, and you know Heartbleed was a pretty big flaw that had also been there for for quite a while, and you know these th these things happen. It's 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 you know the first thing they teach you in any information security or or data security course is if somebody wants to get to your data, they're going to figure out a way to do it. And I think that's that's true of whether it's an open source system or, or a proprietary system. Yeah. Um, it just comes down to, you know, it just comes down really to me. Like, I know the security team is, is working, you know, very hard at, at making Drupal secure. And the way I look at it is this is the first major security issue that I've seen in Drupal in my um, you know seven plus years of, of building and working on Drupal sites, my opinion that's a pretty that's a pretty good track record. Well, yeah, I, and and to your point, um, Heartbleed wasn't even the biggest security issue in open source this year. Shellshock, yeah. you know, w at least with Heartbleed, you had to be using SSL and open SS SSL. You know, the Shellshock <laughs> bug was. Any, if, but Nick, well, there's an, a, an amazing irony there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You um, have to be using the secured connection. Yeah. <laughs> to get compromised, you know. Yeah, but Shellshock, you were able to be compromised. It was, it was similar to this Drupal. I, it, it's similar to other Drupal issues where, in general, Drupal security issues are mitigated by the fact that you actually have to give administrative access to right. the person that's exporting it. Um, and in this case, it was just anonymous users yeah. could. So, you know, I think there's a bit of perspective that's needed, and that is 
you know, years ago, not that many years ago, but um, setting up a Windows server for a, a client, I had that thing on the network less than two hours, and it had been compromised. I hadn't posted a site on it yet. I hadn't done anything other than connect it to the web so I could download the OS patches. And we checked the router, and that thing was getting hammered with over 50,000 requests a minute. And that was just by being turned on. Wow. So, you know, when, when people want to find an exploit, they go where the money is. And, and the money tends to be behind Windows servers, or at least it, that was the truth at the time. That was what all the corporations were using. So those things would get hammered, and you just get killed with that. And, and that, you know, that was happening to, like, the, the biggest software company in the world. And so, you know, Drupal is starting to be used more and more and more, and, and so it's attracting a little bit more scrutiny. Uh, it's the reason why there's more viruses on Windows than on the Mac. You know, it's just greater use brings greater awareness, and you're a bigger target. So, so we, we, are, you, are you saying, Jason, we've arrived? Is that, yes. is that what we're saying here? Well, yeah, I mean, I, and I think so if it's... And, and ultimately, as, as uncomfortable as this is right now, <laughs> It's better for Drupal. It's better for Drupal that more people are, are looking at it, that are taking it seriously, that are really examining all of this and making a better platform and a better product. I agree. So, uh, yeah, it sucks, but in the long run, it's, it's a necessary... I don't say necessary. It's an inevitable part of the maturation and adoption of any platform or product. Exactly. So what you're trying to say is the best news we've had in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we're going to put a close to this show. Um, and we are planning a recap on a full episode of this issue. We're not exactly sure when it's going to happen. I think we're waiting to see how this thing unfolds in the next week or so or two weeks. And see, we'll have a show dedicated to it shortly. And try and get somebody on here that actually knows something more than we do. Oh, exactly. Which is, which is like everyone. Yeah, that's so, probably yeah. pretty easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So uh, let's wrap today. Sure. Okay. Tell us. I'm Jason Pomantel, at Jay Pomantel, pretty much everywhere you might, might care to look. Um, you can find me here for a while, which is awesome. I don't have any, any more travel plans. Um, and where is here? Here is, is at hwdesignco.com, and hopefully uh, in the next week or two we'll be able to share a URL for our, our, our big project launch. Um, and if you want to learn more about type, you can buy my book at rwt.io, and you can come learn about it in a full-day workshop at webcoffee.co. I'm going to be in Boston at the end of January. Fantastic. How about you, John? Oh, man, you can find me on all the social networks at John Picozzi. Uh You can also find me on November 18th speaking uh, to the Newport Interactive Marketers Group down in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, you can find out more information on that at newportinteractivemarketers.com. Um, I'll be talking about uh, maximizing your partner-consultant relationship for a successful project. Nice. Do you have a date on that, John? What's that? Do you have a date on that? For the second week in a row, uh, it's November 18th. Did you say that? Did I, 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 I did just say that. Okay. This is deja, deja vu all over again. Hey, and that was November 18th? <laughs> it's November 18th. Okay, great. We'll or, forget that before next week anyway. Or, or right. November 20th for Stephen Cross. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, you can uh, find me always on at umfink.com. And awesome. a huge thank you again to Oom for sponsoring Nude Camp. That was pretty amazing. Yeah, it was good. Our pleasure. That leaves Nick. How you doing? <laughs> uh, I can be found. <laughs> <laughs> doing good, yeah. Nick. <laughs> I can be found at Nick's fan online or at enlighten.net. Nick was sitting there contemplating avian homicide. <laughs> yeah, what was what was up with you just then? So I think he's on to uh, trying to fix, he, he figured out something else with the compromise, and he's working on that already. Yep. 
All right, so I'm Stephen Cross. You can find me at stephencross.com. Uh, Parallax is doing another webinar next Tuesday, the 11th, at 1 p.m. Sweet. Eastern. It's about Drupal, how Drupal can be used in your business. So if you're interested in, if you're listening to the show, you're probably not interested because you probably already know that, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, you can sign up at parallaxinfotech.com, and that's it for me. Everyone else good? All right. Woohoo. That's good. Hey. We'll talk to you next week. Next week. Thanks. All right. Cheers, everyone.